All right, so let's begin. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> so today I want to do a differential example, and then I'll do a whole bunch of stuff with directional derivatives and gradients. Um, so it should be a uh, last two thirds of the class should mostly be just you guys working through exercises on these, with occasional interruptions for me. Um, a few things I want to do at the beginning. Oh, first, just the schedule. So here are the homework help times. Green means botany lab. Uh, this is Corey's time. The rest are mine. Corey and I will be in the dining hall. Friday, we're actually going to, I think we'll sort of sneak into 14.5 without knowing it today. But Friday, I'd like to get through 14.5 and 14.6. Uh, homework due at the end of the day on Friday. Also, a reminder, I mean, I said this before, but I'll say it again. If you're having answer entry problems in um, web work, which I, I just have a feeling is going to happen this week, um, let, let me know. And don't spend, OK, there's one. I want to let you know this. How do you do exponentials? Is it with How a, you, like is it? Normally, you do the little like, half thing, like on Wolfram Alpha, for instance. Is it not? So it's not? That didn't work for me. OK. It worked for me. Yeah. OK. Check the front. Yeah, the it's very picky with the print too. Picky is one word. Ac accurate, <laughs> not sloppy, but yes. <laughs> Fussy, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'll be, I could take a look at it if, if there's time after class or, then, or this evening or something. Um, or you could always like send me an email like, hey, I'm doing problem 17. I think this is the answer. This is, but when I entered it, it says it's wrong. And then I can check really quick and either say, oh, you're entering it wrong, or you actually made a mistake in your calculation. Um, let's see. Oh, so, so I wanted to do something before we get started today. I wanted to talk a little bit about upcoming classes spring term. Uh, and I usually do this more during registration time, but they're on my mind now for or as we're the faculty trying to put the schedule together to figure out like when classes are going to meet. So. Um, this is sort of all in my head. And also, for you guys, if you want to take a class in the spring, that might, there might be red tape. And so like the sooner we get started, the better. So um, a couple things I wanted to mention. One of the classes I'm offering is thermodynamics. Um, and that I'm going to do at the same, I think it's right now scheduled at the exact same time as calculus, so that if you guys wanted to take it, you, you could, assuming you can get cab fare. Or, it's still, still, I'm still amazed that the school is paying for taxis for you to come here. I love that, I love that image, too. <laughs> um, it seems like it should be a sponsorship opportunity or something. You know, like, anyway, Calc 3 taxi service probably, probably would not be helpful for their business. Oh, yeah, on our, like, yeah, on my horrible eco car. Yeah, I drove that. Um, we have a plug-in electric car. And um, last winter, like, when nobody was around and, like, campus is about shuts down. I was driving it because you need to drive it every couple days to kind of keep it happy. And so I drive it around town and I'll be wa and I sort of forget I was driving it and um, you know I'll sort of pull into a lot or something and like people will be staring at me and I'll be like what the hell are you looking oh right I'm driving like the stupidest looking car on the planet. <laughs> um, anyway if, if you, you maybe you've seen it around maybe you're one of the folks staring at me. Anyway. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 pretty messed up. <laughs> it's it's pretty it's pretty messed up. On the inside, it's all right, but on the outside, yeah, it's just it's silly. Um, so thermodynamics is a physics class. It's not a math class, although there's a lot of math. Um, and one of the and we'll learn a little bit of sort of new math, uh, some probability and combinatorics along the way because that's needed for statistical mechanics, which is part of thermodynamics. Um, so. Um, so there's def there'll definitely be some, not like crazy far out math, but some math you probably haven't exactly seen before. And then it's like lots of use of calculus. Um, again, it's very much a phys physics class. It's taught from a textbook that's sort of a standard like junior, senior level thermodynamics textbook. I think it's a fantastic textbook. It's a fun topic because it's both has like very sort of concrete applications sort of things. I mean, not like you're going to be able to go out and like build refrigerators after the class, but like how do refrigerators work? and why do things evaporate the way they do? And also, uh, second law of thermodynamics is sort of like one of the pillars of physical, all of physical science, and it's fun to think about. So it's kind of nice, pure science and some applied science, maybe. Um, the workload, Ian, you should chime in, because I think you're the, because Corey, you, took, you haven't done that one. Yeah. Um, 
in some ways, as I think of it as a little bit harder than this class, but not tons. Everybody in this class could do it. Um, it's more rather than like, hey, here are like two dozen problems. Practice them. Work out your muscles. OK, I've got it now. It's more like, here are four things you're going to have to puzzle over, four or five problems a week. So they're harder, longer. You know, Usually they're harder, more interesting, more open-ended um, sorts of things. Multi-part. Yeah, multi-part sorts of things, yeah. Um, Take it. I, I had so I had a ton of fun teaching it. It's a really fun topic, and I think the textbook is also just fantastic too. I mean, this this book you could tell it was written by a committee. I mean, it's all right, but the the, uh, the book we use is written by one person who's got a really nice writer's voice and uh, exhibits all the good traits of good physicists in writing. Um, background: It's probably the most important class I think to have had is some some sense of cal of um, chemistry. Um, and if you haven't had chemistry, don't worry. Um, people without a chemistry background did just fine in the class. Although, they, uh, you know, so like Kyle Schenk, who a few of you know, took the class, and he hadn't had a lot of chem or physics, but he figured it out along the way. And if he can do it, you guys can do it. But um, probably having had some you know, some chemistry experience, like thinking about moles, PV equals nRT, at some point in your life would be helpful. But that's kind of about, unlike oh, energy and units, the sort of like kind of basic physics stuff. But it's not like you need to know lots of advanced physics, I would say. Um, so anyway, so that's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday at 9.30. And I don't think it conflicts with any obvious conflicts. But you never know. CUI students are so weird. <laughs> it's so hard to predict. But it doesn't conflict with the global politics class anymore. Doreen moved her slot. Anyway, so, so we, we, we took care of that one. Um, and anyway, all of you, any or all of you would be welcome to take the class. I would say, like, think, so I talked to Bo yesterday, um, like, think it over. Um, it's definitely a fair amount of work. Um, you're probably aware of this, but it will be spring term of your senior year this spring. I, when I was your age, would not have been motivated enough to take a class like that, probably, but maybe you are more motivated than me. Yeah? When does the um, third trimester of CLA go? Roughly eight. Roughly April 1 to like June 4, okay. plus or minus. So I think we usually end a week before you do, but it all depends on snow days. We don't like go extra because of snow days, but you guys do. So we'll see how the, how the winter goes. Um, it would be, so anyway, like I said, I'm, it, definitely think, you know, think it over. Um, it's, not a, it's, not a, I mean, it's not a brutal class, but it is a, you know, it is a chunk of time, a, ch a chunk of work. Um, but any or all of you, and there's no pressure like, oh my god, I want all of you to take it, or like, don't take it. You know, it's entirely up to you. And I'm happy to talk more about it also. Um, the other class I wanted to mention briefly, I also do a class on the physics of energy. That's very, in, in some ways, in terms of the math and physics, it's very introductory. Um, it will be a little bit different. Olivia Margarita, Aura has taken that. I guess those are the three. Um, it'll be different this year because I'm teaching it without Anna, because Anna, I think, is going to Scandinavia. Um, so there won't be a project, so there'll be more physics and math, but it's still not going to be a super physics math sort of thing. Um, that class tends to fill up many times over and probably wouldn't be a good option for you guys. Um, but uh, that's currently scheduled at the same time as a whole bunch of other science classes. So I'm going to try to, including critical zone and oceanography. So anyway, a bunch of faculty are trying to get together to try to like not have that happen. Um, are people, uh, is any, how many people, are, there's no pressure or commitment, are sort of thinking about uh, thermodynamics? OK, fantastic. Um, and then how many are folks are thinking about the energy class? OK. <laughs> OK, that, that's, that's probably good. So the energy class, um, and partly this is, Maybe only applies to Alba since she's only want to raise her hand, but you can sort of spread this, spread the good word out. It's the the math and physics level would not be challenging for you guys. What's engaging about the class is what we're applying the physics to, and what we're applying the math to. Um, so it's math physics people have taken it in the past and liked it, but it's it, it's it's barely algebra. So if you're like, oh my god, I really want to get some math in me, you're, that's not. You're not going to get math. It's not going to seem like a math class, particularly to you all. It's still an awesome class, I, th I think. And people of your background, I mean, have t taken it and I hope have found it worthwhile. But it's not going to push you to new math levels and maybe not even new physics levels. 
Are there questions on any of any of that? I, I don't, I don't know. I've been asking that since the last time you covered it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, maybe your senior year. You don't, you don't need it as badly as you think you need it. <laughs> you can always watch Gilbert Strang's video. Yeah, yeah, there are, I'll definitely teach it, teach it differently as well. Yeah, we watched, we did a class where we watched Gilbert Strang's MIT videos and then we, just did problems together in class, and that was a, a little too extreme, I think, yeah. flip, like flipping the class. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I'll do it. I'll do it differently next time around. Um, and I still don't know exactly what next year looks like, so you know, we'll have we'll have plenty of time to figure that out. I just wanted to kind of plant some seeds of ideas for spring, for spring classes. Okay. Um, oh, so one other one other little thing. Let's see. Do I have this here? So just a little, a little puzzle or thing. Um, so these like cliff bars, like um, I like always like to have some because I don't know if this happens to you, but like I'm, a, I'm like afraid I might get hungry. You know, and like, like I just feel better, right, if I have some of these. And I feel like, and surely I'm projecting onto my cats, but I feel like, like, like my cats get nervous. Like my cats seem really anxious even when they have food in the bowl because they know they might eat all the food like so like are you so sure your just aren't anxious and I'm, I'm some are some some, some aren't but one in, one in particular that not coincidentally the one who's by far the largest um is certainly the most anxious when like the food is getting low so so anyway i think i've got like six of these now and so uh, i'm pretty sure i'm gonna eat two today because because wednesday you know, and or, or sometimes long, stressful days for faculty here. Um, so, how many? How many am I going to have tomorrow if I have six? Right. And then, how many would I have the next day? Yeah. But if all you know is like I eat two a day. But you said today was particularly stressful. That's that's true. But you know, me, tomorrow could be stressful also. I don't I don't really know. But if I'm eating if I'm eating two a day, then I would ha like. I would have four, right? And then, right, and then, okay. All right, so you all just did a tangent line approximation <laughs> that you were refusing to do last time, right? So this is just f <laughs> of t is six plus minus two, ah. Uh, uh, I guess in this case, it's just, it's just, right? That's what you were doing. That's a tangent line. You're like, you, and, and you said, right, good, you, were, you, you all fell for it. Um, right, right. I mean, that this this is my rate of, of cliff bar or power you know, cliff bar consumption. Power bars are a little icky. Cliff bars are yeah, fantastic. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is my rate of consumption. It might not be constant. It probably isn't constant because not every day is the same, and and you know all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but if this is all you know, then like you just sort of extrapolate forward. So you're taking a linear approximation, and you got the rate of change, and then you're like, how far is it changing for? And this is what you started at. What could be easier? Um, so then that's the thing, like, oh, yes, of course, linear extrapolation. We do that all the time. That's how we don't run out of power bars or cliff bars. Ah. Um, so then this is just the two-dimensional version of this. And this is in differential form, which is a nice, tidy way of writing it that says if you've got some function f, that depends on x and y. Why might it change? Well, it might change because x changes. And how much would that change? Well, you take the x rate of change by the x change to get the change in f. And then uh, we also have some y changes going on. So I spent a little while trying to construct an example of like two things changing at once, but I thought the cliff bar would, would be enough. Um, so anyway, we could have an x change and a, and a y change. And this is a particularly, I asserted that this is a particularly useful um, form. It's sort of tidy. It's a nice, nice way to think about things. And you perhaps believe me politely, but I wanted to demonstrate, to do an example um, to, to illustrate this. And this is a really common application. And this, so this sort of thing comes up, um, I think, in science a lot. You've got like a thing that depends on a couple other things. And if, if those other things change, how does the first thing change? So here's, here's a sort of classic um, example. It comes up if you're er uh, doing error estimation. So here's the picture. We've got a box, and it's got dimensions by 80, uh, 80 by 60 by 50. 
and let's say centimeters, use units because it's science. Um, but there's a measurement error on, the, I mean, th so this is what you measured, but there's an error on your measurement, some uncertainty, which is true for any measurement. You can't measure things exactly. Or you could also imagine an engineer built this box, but he or she you know, doesn't measure exactly. And so um, you're uncertain about what the surface area is because you're uncertain about these three lengths. And so that's what this is asking. Like, how, What's the maximum error on, on our sort of measurement or building of the surface area given these three errors. And so again, you can, you can see how in, in, in any sort of experimental science, at least where you have formulas and you're doing more than just counting something, um, this is a really useful sort of technique. So let's work through this. So um, let's see, 80. 50, 40. So surface area is going to be width 60. Okay. 60. Fifth width length. Maybe I should call that depth, but this is already going to be a little d, so I don't really want to do that. So um, there are two front faces. Uh, there are two side faces. And there are two uh, W, L, L, H, H, W. That would be top and bottom. So that's the surface area. And I want to know what would be my change in surface area if there was a change in L, W, and H possibly all at the same time? Well, calculus to the rescue, huh? L, uh, delta F. Let's see, H delta H, W delta W. So that's a differential. Surface area is changing. In this case, it's a function of three variables. No big deal, just so it's three dimensional differential. Uh, it's changing because W could change, H could change, L could change. So let's calculate some of these second derivatives. Um, So what's the, what's the derivative of the surface area with respect to L going to be? Two w. two w, yep. And? Yep. And then let's see, 2, this is going to have to be 2h plus 2l. And then h is going to be 2l plus 2w. Um, so we have values for W, H, and L, and uh, delta L is going to be delta W is going to be delta H, it's going to be 0 0.2. And so we could plug all of that in. And uh, let's see. Before we, before we do that, let me evaluate these separately. Let's see. And I might need some addition help. So this one is 80 plus 60, 140 times 2 is 280. H and L. 220 and W and L 260. So which um, which error or or like in, or mistake if you you know so either again either error in measurement or error in building is going to make the biggest difference in the surface area. In, in the L be in the L dimension because this right so 
um, a small change in L gets multiplied by this bigger number. And you can kind of see that because um, how can you see that? Uh, Well, I mean, algebraically, right, because you've got it's being multiplied by these larger, uh, by these larger terms. So sometimes when you're designing an experiment or if, you're built, if you need to build this to within a certain tolerance, you might want to look at this and say, OK, this is the crucial measurement. I, like, I can take some errors here, but I really, I've got to be precise about this one. Um, OK, so then we could plug all of these things in. I'm not sure if it's worth me doing all of that on the board. Um, but I did this last night somewhere on a little piece of paper. I got 152 square centimeters. And I used a calculator, so I'm reasonably confident. Um, so um, let's see. So this is a really common application of differentials. You could do this another way. You could say, OK, well, I could have a box that's 50 by 60 by 80, and then 50.2 by 60.2 by 80.2, and how much bigger is that? So you could do it other ways. But this is just a really, I think, sort of simple and direct way to do it. And often in math, what, what we're looking for I mean, there is easy ways to do things, like, like the right tool for the job. Like you, know, you, could, you could hammer in all your nails with a screwdriver. I mean, it would work. But like a nice hammer is really going to work better. Um, so anyway, so this is like this is a really nice tool for thinking about changes, and it, it, it sort of again also lets you see how different changes are related. Okay, um, well, let me say just a little bit about directional derivatives, and then you'll get to start taking directional derivatives. So direction all derivatives. Let's try that. This is where we ended last time, and we said okay, you can. Think about how a function changes in one direction. You can think about how a function changes in another direction. But what if we want to like, leave the Cartesian grid behind and go in a diagonal direction? How would we do that? And we said, OK, well, just tell me what direction you want to go in. Let's call that direction u. So here's a direction u. And then we're going to call the rate of change in that direction the unfortunate or fortunate, depending on your point of view, thing f u. And then we learned how to calculate that. Um, we did a little bit of calculus harkening back to calc 1 and came up with this formula. That it, it, we, the thing we got out looked like a dot product. Aha. And so it's a dot product with um, gradient of f, or del f, this is also said. It's important to note in this formula that u must be a normal vector. And then this vector del f, gradient f, grad f, is x derivative, y derivative, just basically turned into a vector in the natural way. What do you mean by a normal vector? Uh, normalized or unit. Sorry. So unit vector is a term I've been using usually. Yeah. Um, so with the uh, vector f being a trigger, the gradient of f, yep. um, does that have to be unit vector as well? Because it's got the little hat on the so other reason I said Oh. I and J are unit vectors, but okay. these things d usually won't be. Okay. Yep. So let's do problem one, and we'll just start using this formula, and that will lead us to an even greater appreciation of the, the gradient vector, and we'll learn some of its additional properties. There we go. So let me say something real quick. Um, I have, I hope, led a few of you into a trap. It's a very common, uh, really, really, really common easy mistake to make. So um, we're, we find the gradient vector. And then we want to know at a particular point what's the gradient vector. We plug in x and y. And now we have a vector. And so now we know we have this nice machinery. We can calculate very easily 
the rate of change in any direction. Just give me the direction, dot it into the gradient vector, got the directional derivative, fu. Nothing. Anyway. Um, so u dotted into i, well, the, oh, that's, I didn't finish that out. That's just going to give me 36. The rate, and what this means is this is the rate of change in the i direction. We actually already know how to do that. That's just the x derivative. This is the rate of change in the y direction. We already know how to do that. That's just the y derivative. But then we get something, aha, finally a diagonal, mixtures of x and y. So exciting. Um, but aha, this is not a unit vector. It sure looks like one because it's 1 plus 1, but it actually has length square root 2 triangles. right? Uh, 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 uh. So no big deal. We learned in the first, maybe end of the first week, beginning of the second week, how to take a vector and turn it into a unit vector. And I said, trust me, this is going to be important in your life. Now it's important. Um, <laughs> so we need a unit vector here. No big deal. We divide by its length. And then we can take the dot product, blah, 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 and we get this. So one thing also, just sort of to underscore here, is that a directional derivative is a scalar. It's a number. What, how steep is it in a particular direction? In asking the question, you need a vector in a particular direction. That's u. And in, cal in answering the question, you need a vector, the gradient vector. But your final answer is still a scalar, just a regular number. I did 36 over square root 2 plus 12 over square root 2. 36 plus 12 is 48 over square root 2. So I just took the x parts, I took the y parts, and I added them. And the 1 over 2 is a scalar you can sort of factor out. Um, so take a few minutes to check through the rest of these if you haven't gotten there. We'll and then and think a little bit about C, D, and E. Um, and in fact, maybe jump ahead and think about C, D, and E. And if you have time, go back and do one of the other ones. I want to make sure everybody thinks about C, D, and E for a couple minutes. And then we'll talk about those, and it will lead us into more gradient vector excitement. So. Um, Let's see. So continuing on just with the algebra, I did the next three. Here, this is, uh, I had to turn it into a unit vector again, because you weren't handed a unit vector. But no big deal. We know how to do that. Then we do the dot product again. This minus sign here means it's 36 minus 12. So I get a smaller answer. Then we have the derivative in the negative x direction, the derivative in the negative y direction. So um, before we answer the next couple, um, let's think geometrically for a second. So here is um, a very rough version of a contour map for this function. And I had Wolfram Alpha do that for me. I knew um, I could picture, all right, it's getting bigger in the x direction, bigger in the y direction, faster in the x direction than the y direction. But I just kind of wanted to see what that looks like. So. Um, and maybe, I, I don't want to put the screen down yet, so I could, but maybe I'll show this to you in a little bit. Or you could you know, dial it up on your own. So it's, anyway, it's getting steeper in this direction. So what have we learned? Well, if we go in the, the x derivative is positive. We're going uphill. The y derivative is, is positive. Then we did a diagonal derivative. That was the third one. And that should be. Um, perhaps a slightly larger number, 48 over root 2 versus 36. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. So similar, uh, maybe not quite larger. But we have a sense that if we wanted to go up as fast as possible, we, right, we go right towards the next contour line. Uh, let's, let's think about this one, i minus j. So that is i and a minus j. So this is. So this is u equals i minus j. And that apparently is still a positive number. Your x and so my drawing is not a good one. But we're still going up if we go in that direction. 
if we go in the negative x direction, we're going downhill. The negative y direction, we're going downhill. So this is this is not a great drawing, but does it the um, what I'm trying to illustrate is that if you have a contour map, you can take a point of the contour map, and you can figure out the sign of the directional derivative by just saying, am I going uphill or downhill if I go in that direction? And, that's what, and then all this vector machinery like, gets the actual numbers out of that. Um, all right. So now let's think a little bit more about, let's think about this. Where's my eraser? Um, so so this is a dot product. And we've been using the component form for dot products. It's a nice way to evaluate things. But I could also write it this way. So. Somebody hands you a gradient vector, and then it says, all right, in what direction? And so, OK, you say, great, I, that's, you've given me a lot. A gradient vector, I can now calculate any directional derivative. So a gradient vector, use, very useful thing. And then you wonder, OK, what could I do? I can choose you. I'm going to choose any direction I want. What should I, how should I choose you to make this quantity as large as possible? Right, so that the unit the u is always a unit vector, so its length is one. So it's like, okay, wh which way can I point? Well, um, if I point in the same direction as a gradient vector, cosine theta co is cosine zero, and cosine zero is one, which is the largest cosine can be. So this is sort of saying, I guess algebraically, what you you sort of have a sense. Well. So this is saying algebraically your intuition that you've maybe sort of developed that, um, do I want to say that? Forget intuition. This says, <laughs> this says, I, I, was, I, I was realizing I was making a circular argument. So I, let's just stop. So um, max fu if u is in direction of del f. So what this means is the gradient vector tells you more uh, I mean, um, than just how to calculate any directional derivative with a dot product. It tells you it's pointing in the direction of, of steepest ascent. So you can calculate any directional derivative, and the gradient itself points in the, in the direction in which the change is largest because of this argument. Um, so that also means if we were um, mountain climbing and wanted to go up the steepest path to give us the greatest challenge, we would head in this direction. What if? Um, Say we had an injured calf, and we didn't want to go up steep at all, and we didn't want to go down. We wanted to stay at the same level. What would I do then? I, I, I'm looking for a less adventurous directional derivative. I want the directional derivative to be 0. How do I do that? Perpendicular to this, right? So if, because if, right, cosine is this sort of thing. So if I'm either at 90 or mm, 270 perpendicular to this, then um, I'll be going along a contour line, and I won't be going up or down. Interesting your response to I have an injured calf is I want to stay on top of the mountain. Well, I don't, want to, I don't necessarily want to stay on the top, but, but I want to move in a direction which, which I neither go up nor down. <laughs> Although I have learned that going down is easier than going up, but, but we'll see. Uh, and then if I wanted to go down as steeply as possible, um, snowboarding, skiing, I've got my form down and I want it the steepest thing, then I would go in the opposite direction of the gradient. Right? So if you want to go up as steep as possible, then follow the gradient. If you want to go down as steep as possible, go in the 180 degrees from the gradient. 
So the gradient carries an enormous amount of information about the, lo uh, the sort of local rate of change of, the, um, of, a, of a function at a point. So let's carry on and do the next problem, and then probably the next problem, and maybe we'll get to the next problem. Anyway, so let's keep, let's keep checking along. Before I do the contour line, I wanted to kind of get a sh and, and look at just the first quadrant. I wanted to kind of get a general shape of this picture overall. And Wolfram Alpha was being uh, a little bit uncooperative. Or this is an example where it takes a little bit of fidgeting to kind of get a picture of what's going on. Um, so this is like these paraboloid bowls, but now it's elongated in one direction. So the contour lines are going to be ovals or ellipses. And this. It's maybe a little hard to see. It's curving. Um, the, this is the y direction. It's curving more quickly in y, because whatever happens to y gets multiplied by 4. Um, and it's less um, curvy in the x direction, which is this way. Even, even with a picture, I still find myself doing interpretive dances. <laughs> um, but, the point, but the point is, um, you know, when you when Wolfram Alpha spits something at you, right? You often then have to think about it, right? I mean, uh, okay, what is it telling me? And also like reading the axes, which is x, which is y, and so on. This is one I think that the contour map is a little clearer to me. I can see. All right, so this is, and again, red means low according to Wolfram Alpha, even though I want it to be hot for high temperature, but that's just me. Um, and so we can see that the contour lines are ellipses. And so if we go in the y direction, um, the contours are, are close together. It's steeper in the y direction. If I'm here and I go in the x direction, I'm going up. But I have to go a really long way to get to the next contour line. Um, OK. So then on this one, I just went it, uh, in the positive quadrant, first quadrant, 0 to 3, 0 to 3. And that is not particularly informative at all. That's why I wanted to get a, a bigger picture before I zoomed in on that quadrant. Hard to see what's going on there. But contour map looks a little, a little better. Let's see. Let me move it down the screen so I can reach it. OK. So then we calculated the gradient vector. And that's, like, that's the key to this. Once you have the gradient vector, you can like, figure out anything about the rate of change of a surface. The, the gradient vector has all the information you need, where it's steepest, where it's not steep. Um, and you can calculate any directional derivative. So let's see. Uh, uh, I guess it was here that I started doing that. So the general gradient vector is x and y. And so this says, for every point in space, there's a gradient vector. So this is something called a vector field that we'll talk about in the last part of the class. But for now, I'll often think about it one point at a time. So what's the gradient at 1, 1? You just plug in 1 and 1. What's a gradient at 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, and so on? So now we're just sort of cranking through the dot product, the magic of dot products that lets us do geometry nicely. And now let's stop and think about what this is telling us. So at 1, 1, the gradient vector is 2, 8. At 1, 1, all right, let's see. So x is 1, y is 1. The gradient vector is 2 in this direction, 8 in that direction. And that, that was a little too fast. Uh, so 2 in this direction, 8 in direction. That's sort of roughly like that. It's. And that is indeed pointing straight from this contour line to that one. That it's pointing in the steepest direction. Uh, let's see. What about 1 and 2? If I'm at x, x equals, x equals 1, y equals 2, now I'm here. And now that vector is 2, 16. That's almost all in the y direction. 16 up, only 2 over. So that's kind of like this which again you can see is perpendicular to the contour lines, I hope. Um, and so on. Let's do one more. Where did we? The directional derivative was at 2, 2. Is that 4 and 16, 4 and 
2, 2. So if I go to 2, 2, uh, 4, 16, that's like 2 and 8. So that's, again, sort of like, like that. Over 1, up 4, over 2, up 8. So again, the gradient vector points in the direction in which the rate of change is the largest. Um, and if you go perpendicular to that direction in the, on either side, then you're moving along a contour line. The d directional derivative would be 0. If you go 180 degrees, then instead of going this way, you're going this way. You're skiing down as fast as you can go. So the gradient vector, again, it's, it, it gives all this nice information. Uh, so here, um, suppose you want to know what's the rate of change in the minus 1 plus 2 direction. All right, well, this is one, a sneaky one. It's not a unit vector, but oh, no big deal. I know how to make it a unit vector. Magnitude is root 5. Divide by root 5, I do the dot product. I, I didn't skip steps this time to sort of see how this is working out. And we get 28 over root 5. So again, the directional derivative, the answer is a number. It's just a rate of change. How steep is it? If I move one foot in this direction, do I go, how much do I go up or down? Um, in order to ask the question, you need a vector. In order to answer the question, you need a vector. But the, an but the answer you get is a scalar. Um, all right, so let's see if this makes sense. I'm at 2, 2. Here I am at 2 and 2. And I'm going in the minus 1 plus 2 direction. So I'm going in this direction. So I'm still going uphill, even though I'm going in the negative x direction. If I was going all in the x direction, I'll be going downhill very slowly. But I'm going oh, uh, left 1 up 2, something like that. And you can see I'm still going up. So it makes sense that I get a positive number for that directional derivative. So I'm going to interpret your expressions as satisfaction. I feel fairly confident in that. I mean, you're much more emotive than yesterday. Um, so let's, let's try problem three. And we'll probably wrap up on, on this one. Um, yeah, so let's, let's give problem three a try. All right, let's see. So um, now we have a function that we're thinking of as a temperature. It's a function of two variables, x and y. And the first step in this, we want to calculate the gradient vector. That's the key to understanding rates of change on surfaces. You want to calculate the gradient vector, because you can figure out everything from that. So here's a gradient vector. Um, this is a partial derivative of t with respect to x. This is a partial derivative of t with respect to uh, y. And then, OK, that's a general gradient vector. What's going on at x equals 5, y equals 1? Well, I plug in, and I get the particular gradient vector 30 in the x direction, 72 in the y direction. So let's go to a picture. This is, I had Wolfram Alpha plot this. And let me just move this down so I can reach it without, mm -mm. OK. So here I am. So here I'm at x equals 5, y equals 1. And this says the gradient vector is 30 in the x direction, 72-ish, 72 in the y direction. So that's roughly over this way, up that way. And yeah, that is about, right, so these, this is getting warmer. This is the opposite of what it, the color should be on Wolfram Alpha. Um, so this is, these are higher values here. And so the gradient vector points in the direction of the greatest change. So if this sad little cal caterpillar wants to get um, away from the heat, it should go not this way, but this way. So I just took both of the numbers and made them negative, minus 30, minus 72. So it's going this way and this way. And you can see, yep, that's going downhill as fast as I can go. Um, so now let's think that the question Albo is asking, what am I doing over here? So the gradient vector tells you the direction of the greatest change. Its magnitude is the rate of the greatest change. That wasn't a great sentence. Let me, um, so this direction, that tells you the direction in which it is the steepest. 
And this vector, the magnitude of this vector, is the magnitude of that change. Okay, um, and the magnitude of the vector in the opposite direction is let's see, how, how so yeah. So this is how I get a directional derivative. This is fu. Sorry. This is no, there's, just, there's just no other way to say it. Um, so fu is this. And you say, all right, I want to go um, in the direction that t is going. So then cosine theta is 0. It's 1. And this is always a unit vector. That's 1. So that's why I'm saying that the magnitude of the gradient vector is the magnitude of the rate of change in the steepest direction, either up or down. Yes, let's think about units. So um, the function t is in, has units of degrees Celsius. Oh, this really isn't realistic, is it? <laughs> um, and this is, so this would be, right, yeah, so, this, so this is pretty, so this is a chain, this is a, this is a yeah, so probably, well, we don't know what the absolute, well, I guess we could figure out what the temperature is. This is just the rate of change. This says that if this, if this little caterpillar goes one centimeter in, in the, the direction of the negative gradient, um, it will cool off by 78 degrees. Centigrade. Centigrade, yeah. So that's, that's a lot. Um, again, probably not, not super realistic. So then if we wanted to know how it's the, the, the rate at the, so the answer to part B was saying, was looking at, this tells you how fast it's changing with respect to distance, but maybe you want to know how fast is it changing with respect to time. And so I claim if I take, was it 0 0.8 mm -hmm. centimeters per second, 78 centigrade per centimeter, then this is going to experience 4 fifths of 78, yikes, is 62.4. Thank you. OK, so this is not biomechanically feasible for caterpillars, because Caterpillars cannot, I'm pretty sure caterpillars can't handle this rapid a temperature change. Again, I'm not a biologist, but that's just a hunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> true, if this was in units of like millikelvin, maybe it would be fine, <laughs> it would be all right. <laughs> um, or milli Celsius, yeah. So anyway, um, so the main, and the main purpose of this is a, another example of how to use a gradient vector. And this is a rate of change. And we've been doing lots of math, but we can also do sort of do word problems. And as Portia was reminding us, units can help, help this make sense. So um, now you're good friends with a gradient vector. Yes? So could you uh, multiply the rate of vector? Yep. And we got the second one, but how did the first one? Oh, that was given in the problem. I just said, if the caterpillars move, if this is how fast the caterpillars can run, also, I no claimed accuracy there for caterpillars. But if the caterpillar runs this fast, this is how fast its temperature would be going with respect to time. Okay. Yeah. So um, we will maybe do, maybe do one more word problem like this to um, solidify gradient vectors. And then we'll do um, multidimensional chain rule next time, which is a lot more fun than it sounds. So I need to go to faculty meeting, so I, I can only stick around for a minute or two, but I'll be around this evening. <laughs>